Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. This is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about the living world. <clears throat> Topic for the day is going to be vertebrates. Just like yesterday, we are going to kind of run through the evolution of vertebrates. I'm going to warn you right now, grab yourself some popcorn, soda, whatever you got to do. This is going to be a long video. We got a lot of information to cover, so let's go ahead and get on into it. By the end of the video, here are the things that I need you to know or be able to do. Track the evolution of vertebrates from lancets to people, and list major derived characters that separate one group from the next. So without further ado, let's jump on in and start trekking through some of this material. First thing is the vertebrates. We're calling them the great adapters because as far as we know, yes, in terms of numbers, biomass, whatever, insects rule, rule but when it really comes to the animals that dominate the land, it is the vertebrates. So we're going to kind of track their development from the, I guess, least complex lancelet, all the way up to humans. As we go through today's video, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a slide that has got the characteristics of a group and then a couple of rep representative examples. Um, you can assume that characteristics that are presented on one slide are found in all of the animals that are, you know, mentioned after that unless I indicate otherwise. So we're going to start at the most very basic, and that is just at the level of a chordate. Chordates have got the following characteristics. They've got a notochord. Now, a notochord is a cord that runs down the length of the back, and it is generally used for support. Um, it's usually found in the embryo version of a chordate. There's a dorsal hollow nerve cord. So this is going to end up usually developing into the central nervous system. It's usually found in the embryo. Um, quick little diagram. If you were to draw just like a basic embryo, 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 um, you would have kind of like the developing organs right here. Dorsal hollow nerve cord runs along the back. That'll develop into the nervous system. The notochord runs in between the two right here, and it is often used for support. Next characteristic to be aware of is pharyngeal slits or clefts. So at some point in the development of these organisms, they're going to show slits up in this area of the embryo, and in some organisms that'll become gills, in other organisms it'll develop into the bones of the ears or something like that. But this is present in all chordates at some point in their development. And a muscular postanal tail. Now, obviously, in organisms like humans, this has disappeared. But in most other chordates, this is a characteristic that is present. The most basic chordate is known as a lancelet. There's also an organism known as a tunicate. We're not going to talk about either of those. But these are the two most basic organisms that show all of those characteristics that we just talked about as saying, all right, this thing is a chordate. Now moving forward and becoming a little bit more advanced, we're going to go from the characteristics of a chordate to a craniate, which means that we are starting to add a cranium, a head, to the organism. Um, examples of craniates are not examples. Characteristics of craniates that differentiate them from the other chordates, the ones below them, is that they have two or more sets of Hox genes. Remember those that are the genes that set up body plan and segmentation and all that good stuff. They've got a neural crest which gives rise to many of the skull bones. When the embryo is developing, there is a line of cells along the back that is known as the neural, neural crest. As that embryo develops on into its adult form or even its juvenile form, um, those cells of the neural crest are going to give rise to many of the bones of the skull. And there is an active and extensive muscular system found in these organisms. Finally, they have hearts that have at least two chambers and you get specialized blood cells, so red blood cells, white blood cells, things like that. Our representative most basic example of a craniate is known as the hagfish. They are gross fishes. They can turn themselves into knots. They secrete mucus. They are nasty, but they are the most basic organism that shows all of the characteristics of a craniate. Moving forward, we get to the vertebrates. So hagfish, no vertebral column. In the vertebrates, we see an extensive skull, usually surrounding a brain. We see a backbone composed of vertebrae that wraps around the spinal cord. Um, remember, I talked about that hollow dorsal nerve cord developing into the nervous system. So the organisms before this, that nerve is just kind of naked. Once we get to the vertebrates, it gets surrounded by a vertebra, backbone. And if my point will come up, we have a complex nervous system. 
Now, the most basic form of a vertebra is known as a lamprey. Lamprey looks almost exactly like a hagfish, except for they got that round mouth full of teeth. And based on what I just talked about, we know that they have a <clears throat> rudimentary skull, and they've got vertebrae surrounding their uh, nerve cord. All right, stepping on forward, we move up to the nathostomes. So we have got jaws. Nathostome means jawed mouth. Um, hagfishes, obviously, they, they didn't have jaws. They just got that big old round sucker cup. So nathostomes have jaws, at least four sets of hox genes. So we're starting to set up a pretty complex body plan by this point. Enlarged forebrain that allows enhanced senses, Right there, enhanced sense of smell and vision obviously allows for some learning and some planning and some of the more complex actions that you see in more advanced animals. And lateral line and aquatic craniates. So in examples such as fishes and sharks, they've got a organ that runs down their sides called the lateral line. It allows them to sense pressure changes, vibrations in the water, things like that. Obviously, terrestrial organisms don't have them, but it is something that is unique to the aquatic versions of the nathostomes. Our most basic nathostome is the chondrichthys. Now these are your sharks, these are your rays, and these are your skates. A skate is kind of like a ray. Um, they are the most basic nathostome. thing to know about them is their skeletons are made out of cartilage. So we have not yet gotten to a bony skeleton, but we've got, you know, we've got a skull, we've got jaws, we've got teeth. We do have a version of a skeleton. Good muscular system, good nervous system by this point. And then we're going to talk about the ray and lobed fin fishes. A little bit more advanced, all of the organisms from here on out are going to have an ossified skeleton, which means that they've got bones made out of calcium carbonate. Um, these types of fishes have an operculum, which is a covering over their gills. If you look at my little diagram here, right here is the operculum. Um, sharks, they don't have any covering over their gills. They've just got open gills on the outside. Two types of fishes. There's the ray finned fishes, which are the traditional fishes you think of. They've got, you know, their fins consist of a set of bones, and then there is really thin membrane in between the bones, no meat, no muscle, nothing like that. There are also lobe finned fishes, of which this guy is an example. In a lobed finned fish, you've actually got a section of the fin that has got meat and muscle and bone in it. So these are the guys that they think maybe became the amphibians because they show rudimentary limbs. Ray finned fishes don't have any of this meat or bone in their fins. Continue our trek forward, we get to tetrapods. Now like I said, the thought is that those lobe finned fishes eventually became the tetrapods. Examples are not examples, characteristics of tetrapods are as follows. Tetra means four, pod means foot. So we've got four limbs here. We've got digits, so that's toes and fingers. We have got another characteristic that doesn't want to come up. There we go. Head separated from the body by a neck. Obviously, the neck is longer or shorter depending on the organism, but the head is separated from the body. Pelvic girdle fused to the backbone. So this is uh, specialized to life on land. It allows the legs to transfer energy to the rest of the body. And no gills are found in the adults. Now, there are still pharyngeal gill slits, which resemble gills in like embryonic forms. But once you get to the adult, there aren't any gills found. And our most basic tetrapod is going to be the amphibian. Um, obviously, this includes frogs. It includes things like, well, frogs, salamanders, Sicilians. Sorry, I had a brain cramp there for a second. Um, special characteristics of amphibians. They need to live in damp habitats. Now, obviously, there are exceptions to this rule such as toads. Now, know that a toad is just a frog with thick skin, but usually they need a damp habitat. Um, they conduct a bunch of gas exchange across their skin. Now, you do see some lungs, but a lot of the gas exchange happens across the skin. They rely on external fertilization for development, and in a lot of amphibians, there is a difference between the juvenile form and the adult form. Continuing to move forward, we have got the amniotes, which are organisms that have amniotic eggs that have four specialized membranes. We fall into this category because the placenta um, that is found in mammals does have four membranes to it. Obviously, we don't have a shell, though. Um, if there's an egg, that egg does have a shell. Amphibians have got eggs, but their eggs do not have shells. And you've got a rib cage that allows ventilation for the lungs. So amphibians rely on bringing air into the mouth and then forcing it into the lungs. In amniotes, you get a rib cage that lifts, allowing the lungs to expand. Most basic 
Amnio is going to be our reptiles and birds. Now, reptiles and birds are grouped together, though they are different, obviously. Um, in these organisms, though, we see scaly skin, we see shelled eggs, which is good for laying eggs on land because they are protected, they don't dry out, things like that. You do see internal fertilization, and they are ectotherms, which means they are cold-blooded. Now, in our birds, you've got some other modifications. Um, scales have been modified into feathers. The bones have got a bunch of openings in them so that they are light, and obviously, they can fly. And let's go ahead and finish this out. We move on up to the mammals. Now, special characteristics of mammals, there are a bunch of them. You get milk produced from mammary glands, giving the name mammal. You get hair. You get endothermic, which means that they produce and regulate their body temperature inside. They have efficient respiration and circulation, much more so than reptiles. We've got a diaphragm for ventilation, which is a thin muscle that separates our abdom abdominal cavity from our thoracic cavity, and that lifting up and down allows us to breathe, and large brains capable of planning, complex thought, things like that. Just a step above the mammals, you've got the primates, which obviously are mammals, but primates have the following characteristics. you got hands and feet that can grasp opposable thumbs. They are good. Digits with flat nails. You've got large brains and flat faces and complex social behaviors. And then obviously, so obviously this includes most of your monkeys, lemurs, things like that. And then finally, we get to the humans. Our characteristics that make us unique from everything else in the world are that we have an upright stance, which means we stand on two feet. A bipedal gait, meaning that we walk on two feet. You know, you don't see us crawling around on our hands and knees. Language, symbolic thought, artistic expression. A lot of what makes humans separate from everything else is all up in the brain. It's about our culture. It's about things we do that honestly don't relate to survival, things we do just for fun. Um, so those are some of the things that set humans apart. And we use complex tools. Obviously, right now I am talking to a complex tool that will be displayed over a complex tool. We have reduced jawbone and jaw muscles, obviously giving us the flat face that is characteristic to humans. So I know that's a lot of material. I just want you to try to string together the major steps that it took to get from one group of organisms to the next and how we got all the way from a lancelet up to a human. I'm betting that you're probably going to need to rewind and watch some of that, but thank you for sticking with it. Um, this has been the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. Hopefully we'll see you again.